Hi, it's me, Professor Ellie Anderson, and um, I'm here to do a read aloud of a talk that I gave at Harvard University at the ACLA conference, which is, oh God, what is that? <laughs> what does ACLA stand for? Association of Com Comparative Literature, right? Okay, hold on. American Comparative Literature Association. Okay, so I'm here to do a real read aloud of a uh, presentation that I gave at the 2016 conference of the um, ACLA. And it's about Derrida and Michelle de Montaigne. So yeah, go ahead and read it. I want to start with a quote from Montaigne. Oh yeah. What's the title? It's called Half Mourning the Friend, Impossible Incorporation in Derrida and Montaigne. And it was part of a panel that was about the work of Jacques Derrida in relation to Michelle de Montaigne, the Renaissance philosopher, organized by Katie Chenoweth of Princeton University. So I want to start with a quote from Montaigne from his essay on friendship. He writes, I was already so accustomed to being everywhere one of two that it now seems I am no more than half, end quote. In discussing the interrelation of mourning and friendship in the work of Montaigne and Derrida, there are so many possible places from which to start. One could begin with the role of writing, with the oft-noted fact that Montaigne begins writing essays in the wake of the death of his intimate friend, Etienne de la Boétie and the kinship between writing and death that Derrida explores at such length throughout his life. One might consider the metaphors of digestion and eating the other, the question of fraternity, the bequest of La Boétie's library to Montaigne, or the way that Derrida's claim that the death of a friend is the end of the world might relate to Montaigne's experience of the death of La Boétie. A number of scholars have begun at one or other of these compelling points of departure, here, I would like to start with a question of arithmetic, encapsulated in Montaigne's enigmatic statement. I was already so accustomed to being everywhere one of two that it now seems I am no more than half. This will offer us a chance to consider some of the major themes that emerge in light of mourning the friend for both Derrida and Montaigne, and will draw much from the wealth of contributions that other scholars have already made on this topic in the wake of these two prodigious thinkers. No more than half. Montaigne feels reduced to this by the death of his friend and brother, Etienne de la Boétie. Yet according to Montaigne's formulation, it is not merely that his friend was his other half, now cut off from him by death. Rather, living, each friend was truly one of two. What is this strange logic that does not leave Montaigne as one after the death of his friend, but instead divides him in two? How does the loss of a friend cut so deeply that it seems to cut off not one, but one and a half of the members of friendship? What is the nature of this friendship that in life and in death doubles and halves Montaigne in a manner so at odds with arithmetic? Might we say, following Derrida's remarks on life, death, and survival, that La Boétie retains a half-life in his friend Montaigne after his death? It's often been remarked that at the end of his life, La Boétie begged Montaigne to give him a place. Could not this injunction to give him a place be La Boétie's re request to live on within his friend, not merely as part of Montaigne, but as La Boétie? That is, could La Boétie be asking to live on in Montaigne, but as different from him, thereby maintaining his singularity or otherness, even in death? These remarks echo a number of those found in Derrida's extensive writings on mourning and friendship. Of course, talk of halves and wholes cannot help but remind us of Derrida's description of mourning as half-mourning, or demi-deuil. Half-mourning troubles the distinction between self and other, between mourning and melancholia, and between interjection and incorporation. It keeps the dead friend suspended somewhere between life and death, interiorized as other within the surviving friend. But more specifically, with regard to Montaigne's reduction to half by his friend's death, we might say that Derrida too depicts being cut down to half by mourning. The death of a friend does not leave one intact, whole, complete. It is not a removal of something on the outside, but rather cuts deep within. And yet Derrida and Montaigne both suggest that this mourning, which cuts life down to half its size, is the very condition of life and of the living. Jeff Bennington writes of this move in Derrida, quote, half mourning we might suspect, just is life itself, as the state of survival or living on, we might also venture to call half-life. Life is always half-life, end quote. 
Montaigne's condition of being no more than half after the death of, of La Boissie, we might say, is the condition of life itself. And continuing to follow Bennington, half-life and the morning that marks it is, quote, always less than half and more than half, end quote. It will be the task of this presentation to explore the way that mourning the friend at once more and less than half figures into the work of Derrida and Montaigne. Orienting our discussion around the question of haves and wholes will offer a lens through which to view the disruption of a unified self and other at work in both of these thinkers. In this regard, Montaigne and Derrida, as the precursor to and the heir of modern philosophy, encourage their readers to think the relation of friends as mutually contaminating and yet also singular. I will be focusing here not on Derrida's explicit considerations of Montaigne in the politics of friendship, but will instead draw a parallel between Derrida's mourning of Paul de Man as depicted in Memoirs for Paul de Man and Montaigne's mourning of La Boissie. I will also highlight Derrida's turn to Montaigne in a letter to Catherine Malibu, published in Counterpaths, before finally suggesting that the relation to the friend whom one mourns has the structure of a promise. Well, for the purposes of time, I have limited my remarks to the event of mourning occasioned by the friend's death. What I say here would also hold for the friendship shared while the friends both remain alive, following a deconstructive account of life and death. Derrida's account of mourning as half mourning attends to a dissymmetry or distance between two friends and death. And this is illustrated particularly vividly in Memoirs for Paul de Man. After a friend dies, one remains faithful to friendship by leaving the friend a place within oneself. At the same time, one must acknowledge that the friend is not present as such. The interiorized friend, Derrida writes, quote, can be neither the so-called resurrection of the other himself, the other is dead and nothing can save him from this death, nor can anyone save him from it, nor the simple inclusion of a narcissistic fantasy and a subjectivity that is closed upon itself or even identical to itself, end quote. The project of incorporating the dead friend into oneself is an impossible task. The friend lives on as living dead, yet retains a certain inaccessibility or irreducible otherness. We might say that the dead friend keeps within, keeps a secret. Because to imagine that the friend could be mourned completely, gotten over by being interiorized, would be a gesture of infidelity toward the friend. Mourning is figured as half mourning. Derrida relates mourning the friend to the rhetorical figure of prosopopoeia, drawing on Demand's own work on the topic. When one can no longer speak to the friend, one speaks for the friend, and one speaks for the other, in what Derrida calls a, quote, hallucinatory prosopopoeia, end quote. In contrast with the tendency in Montaigne to consider, to consider friendship a unification or blending of souls, I would like to suggest that Montaigne's friendship to La Boissie is one of half mourning. As many commentators, including Derrida himself, have pointed out, a certain Montaigne would suggest that friendship eliminates any difference, distance, or distinction between the two friends, culminating in the complete fusion of wills described by Montaigne in Of Friendship. Yet, another Montaigne fiercely contests this ideal of fusion. While there are a number of instances of this contestation in the essays, I'd like to consider two instances of this drawn from the letter that Montaigne writes to his father after the death of La Boissie. First, La Boissie's deathbed visions, and second, La Boissie's famous request that Montaigne give him a place. In the letter, Montaigne reports to his father that La Boissie had consuming visions on his deathbed that he could not communicate. When Montaigne asked La Boissie to describe them, recalling that there's never been a time that when they have not shared their every thought with each other, the dying man responds, I cannot. The deathbed visions constitute a domain of secrecy or obscenity that Montaigne cannot access. At the moment, as the moment of his friend's death draws near, a limit is drawn between the friends, forcing Montaigne to confront the irreducible otherness of his friend and brother. On my reading, this irreducible otherness is also perceptible in the well-known request La Boissie makes to Montaigne before his death, give me a place. While commentators have offered various interpretations of this statement, I would suggest that this request demonstrates La Boissie's desire to retain his singularity in death. Rather than being consumed by his mourning friend, successfully digested and transformed into a part of Montaigne's self, La Boissie may desire a place within Montaigne that is nonetheless not reducible to him. This interpretation is close to that of Franz Carré, for whom Montaigne's injunction, give me a place, amounts to the idea that, quote, 
dead. I subsist by your side in the secret warmth of a friendship over which carnal separation has no hold. That our minds, esprit in French, continue to be interlaced, me and you, you and me, end quote from the Carré quote. Given that Montaigne's essay form developed out of his grief at no longer being able to write to his friend, we might say that these essays are addressed to the La Boisy who lives on in Montaigne after his death, yet remains other to him, cut off or in secret. Finally, we might circle back here to the quote with which I began. That is Montaigne's statement that where he was one of two, he now seems to be no more than half. On the one hand, we might just conclude that this quote illustrates the ideal unification of souls accomplished in the friendship. What was once two has become one, such that the absence of one of the friends feels like the absence of one's other half. And yet, if the souls of Montaigne and La Boisy were perfectly fused and bound, then it would not seem that the death of one would affect this. Would not Montaigne continue to live on as when his friend was alive, because even when the friend was living, there was no distance between the two that needed to be bridged? The lack of perfect unity between the friends is necessary for La Boissy's request to be given a place to make sense. If La Boissy and Montaigne were completely fused or unified, there would be no need for the friend to ask for a place after his death. The impasse between the two friends that forecloses their dreamed of unity is also figured in Montaigne's remarks on death more generally. In the essays, Montaigne makes clear that friends do not accompany one another in dying. In Heideggerian terms, we might say that death is what singularizes. This theme emerges particularly in the essay of Vanity, where Montaigne states that, quote, dying is not a role for society. It is an act for one single character, end quote. Montaigne does not merely mean here that it is better to die alone than to die among others. He also means that it is better to die alone than to die even among one's closest friend, brother, or second self. The reason for this is that Montaigne has, quote, enough to do to console himself without having to console others, end quote. Because his view of friendship puts the other before oneself, Montaigne considers the presence of the friend when one is near death to be an added source of stress or heartbreak. These remarks about death upset the ideal of unity Montaigne upholds in On Friendship, of friendship, sorry. One might object that perhaps Montaigne only praises solitary death because by the time of writing the essays, his close friend La Boissy had already died. However, one might respond that the narrative of La Boissy's own death, particularly the manner by which La Boissy's deathbed scene reveals a distance between the two friends, suggests otherwise. As Elizabeth Guild puts it, describing La Boissy's death, quote, death's proximity reveals as illusory the imaginary identity, symmetry, and reciprocity of love, end quote. Montaigne's remarks about the benefits of dying alone are curious given his claims about unity and fusion with the friend. They're even more curious when considered alongside a word that Montaigne coins within the same essay, the word commourin, translated as partners in death. The word comes up when Montaigne wonders, after having claimed that he would most like to die alone, whether one might die a voluptuous death, as did the partners in death, Antony and Cleopatra. Derrida reflects on this word in a, in a letter to Catherine Malibu from May 1997, which is reproduced in Counterpaths. The occasion for Derrida's reflection is the topic of travel, and while I suspect that considering the place of traveling the work of Derrida and Montaigne would be a fruitful project, here I'll merely note that the way that this term is, um, sorry, here I'll merely note the way that this term complicates the question of death and friendship. Derrida writes that he is very envious of this word, commourant. It suggests for Derrida, quote, those one dies with or eats and lives with, end quote. Shortly afterward in the same letter, Derrida will call Montaigne his alibi and confidant. Compellingly for our purposes here, Derrida unpacks this word of his confidant to show the way that the commourant does not restore an ideal of unity or blending of souls. While this word might initially suggest that two can die together, dying with commourant, Derrida finds in it instead, quote, dissymmetry, irreversibility, no return, end quote. Even the partners in death, he writes, quote, each die, and they both die before and after the other, before as after the other, end quote. When it comes to dying together, the time is out of joint. And yet we might try. Derrida suggests that Montaigne's account of dying alone and together might gesture towards a new meaning of essayer, which in French means both to try and, um, well, it means to try, but then that's where we get the term essay from, and essay is an attempt. Um, so he suggests that Montaigne's account of dying alone and together might gesture towards a new meaning of essay, quote, 
as if essay or to essay meant, first of all, let's try to die together. Como rir, end quote. Two friends may try to die together then with the knowledge that one will always survive the other and that death can never be dealt just once between them. I would like to end by returning to the place that La Boissie pleads Montaigne to leave him after his death, and which I have suggested is illuminated by Derrida's understanding of mourning as half mourning. Given that for both Derrida and Montaigne, the self is not a transparent, self-knowing or sovereign subject, but rather always already marked by otherness, the question of whether one is really leaving a place for the other resists an answer. I would argue that it is heterogeneous to knowledge in the way that the decision more generally is heterogeneous to knowledge on Derrida's view. For Derrida, mourning the friend not only reveals the otherness of the other, but also the otherness of oneself. He states in Memoir that after the death of the friend, quote, in himself, by himself, of himself, he is no more, nothing more. He lives on only in us. But we are never ourselves and between us, identical to us, a self is never in itself or identical to itself, end quote. The notion that a self is not identical to itself is indicated in a variety of Montaigne statements throughout the essays and has been a vibrant topic of scholarship. Here, I will mention just two statements that circle back to the theme of doubling and having in two with which we began. First, Montaigne's reflection in Of Glory that, quote, we are, I know not how, double within ourselves, end quote which suggests that it is not only the presence of the friend that doubles, but there is a rather always already a doubling within the self. Second, Montaigne reflects on the deaths of various parts of himself in, of experience. He meditates on a dead tooth that has just fallen out, saying, quote, that part of my being and several others were already dead, others half dead, thus do I melt and slip away from myself, end quote. As Gilt puts it, quote, it is not as Montaigne came to be so acutely aware just about others being different to ourselves, but also about the knot of relations between what we do not know in or of ourselves and what that strangeness, which already inhabits us, allows us to recognize and bear in others, end quote. I will not be able to do justice to the consequences of the self-doubling and half-dying that is at work at the heart of life. I would, however, like to conclude by arguing that one consequence of these themes is that leaving a place for the friend is something one promises but which one can never be certain of having achieved. Promising to leave a place for the friend is a promise to mourn the friend without getting over it. It is the promise to interiorize without interiorizing fully. It is the promise to half mourn one's other whole or half. Derrida describes friendship in memoir as, quote, a promise and a grief which are never over, end quote. And this promise that characterizes friendship is a promise that is not of the realm of knowledge, one promises to the friend without knowing what one promises and whether one can keep this promise. Yet Derrida states that, quote, non-knowledge is the very thing that makes of the promise to the other a true promise, the only true promise, end quote. A promise worthy of the name exceeds knowledge. For Derrida, this lack of knowledge links the promise with the departed friend, insofar as a promise is a promise to the other as other, or as always already departed. Derrida is led to claim, quote, a promise has meaning and gravity only with the death of the other, end quote. With respect to the injunction to leave the friend a place, to half mourn the friend, we might draw attention to a promise of philia that is always already contaminated by philautia. In the politics of friendship, Derrida notes that Montaigne's view of friendship is not separate from philautia, which in ancient Greek means self-love. Philia is love, friendly kind of love. Philautia is um, love of oneself. You see philia with an out or autos, uh, root of autos in the, in the middle there. This comes up in Aristotle. Um, in light of the doubling of the self to which Montaigne's essays continually attest, a simple arithmetic of self plus other, whether one self plus one friend, half self plus half friend, or half self plus one and a half friend is insufficient. Montaigne and Derrida, of course, upset the modern ideal of self-knowledge, and in so doing, also upset an ideal of knowledge of the other. One cannot know whether one is mourning the friend out of self-love or love of other. One cannot know whether the other within is other or oneself. One cannot know whether one is doing justice to keeping the other alive within, alive as dead, as other. And yet one must try. As Derrida puts it, let us try to die together. Let us essay at being commourant and half mourners. Indeed, let us promise to do so.
that is the end of the presentation. It was fun to revisit this because the time that I presented it at Harvard a number of years ago was not recorded. Um, I've worked a lot on Derrida. I wrote my dissertation on him, which I finished the same year in 2016, translated his work as well. Um, if you're interested in some more, some work that's more accessible than this, because this is academic in nature, check out my podcast, Overthink, listen to, um, yeah, listen to that wherever you get your podcasts or take a look at our uh, Continental Thought Lectures YouTube playlist or just our channel in general. Thanks so much.